Well, hello everyone and welcome to our Conroe ISD update number 17. Uh, today is March 9th. Thank you for taking some time uh, to be with us this evening. Whether you're watching us live or you had an opportunity to, to catch this later as it's been recorded, we appreciate you giving up your family time uh, to come and spend it with us. And uh, we do appreciate these opportunities to have conversation with you. We hope they, that you find them useful. Um, it is this really a chance for us to give you the hows and the whys of, of decisions that are made in Conroe ISD in much more detail than we could ever give you in an email. And I know for many of you, uh, you crave that extra detail. You want all of that information and we, we want to give it to you. And for others of you, this format might absolutely drive you crazy and it's just too much. And for those of you, we're going to try to provide you with an update. Uh, after the fact that we can just give you the bullet points if that's what you crave. Uh, we, we really want to communicate with you in the best way for you um, that works. So uh, thanks again for, for being with us. I hope that you're doing well now after the freeze. I know it was very hard in our community. Um, we continue our recovery efforts and I hope that you and your family now are uh, getting back closer to normal uh, into your routines and, and life is, is better for you all. I um, want to start tonight, kind of as we always do, it's good to start with good news, right? It's good to, to, to share out things that are going on in our community that we can be really proud of. And I want to start by saying that if you look at our community-wide, our COVID numbers have really decreased uh, over the last month or so, and that's really good news. We're back now to the level really where we were most of the fall prior to Thanksgiving, if you look out in the into the community. And so we saw a large jump after Thanksgiving and it never really came all the way back down. And then we saw a huge jump after Christmas. And, and um, the one positive thing that may have occurred with the freeze is it did really drop our uh, COVID numbers in the community and we're seeing them back at a good level. Hopefully uh, they will stay there through spring break and after spring break, certainly something that we'll need to watch since we We've seen that precedent over the last two times that we were out of school, but that's good news and something that we should all feel good about and, and know that we're getting better uh, as a community. Also really proud to see the vaccination attempt within our community as we know that's really a key to herd immunity. It's a key to getting us back to normal that we all crave so much. And so um, we're trying to do our part as a school district. You may have seen in the news that we have made our Wood Forest Bank Stadium uh, parking lot available for vaccinations. Memorial Hermann used uh, that site for two different weekends and, and served about 8,000 people. And now we are working directly with Montgomery County and they are using our site every day, five days a week. And they're doing, I believe, five or 6,000 per day at, at Wood Forest Bank Stadium, that's a difference maker. And that will quickly make a difference in our community. Uh, and, and we're really proud to be a part of that. Uh, really thankful that last week teachers became eligible uh, and school staff to receive the vaccine. And we were able to work with our partners at Lone Star Family Health and through our site there at Wood Forest Bank Stadium to uh, get many of our staff members vaccinated on Friday. Uh, and it's also a source of pride for us that that site and the infrastructure that we built uh, will also benefit all of our surrounding school districts. So they, their teachers will be able to come through uh, and be vaccinated because of the, the effort and the hard work of our team. And that's something that we can all take pride in as a community that uh, you know we're doing good deeds and, and our impact is being felt not just within Conroe ISD, but well beyond. And so we're thankful for that. When we go back to our freeze and the last time that we were uh, here talking to each other, we were talking about coming back to school on that Monday following the freeze. And it was a, a tough situation, but we were fortunate to be able to do it because of the hard work of our maintenance team and uh, the dedication of our teachers to be there and really proud that we were able to be there that day. I heard so many stories of families in the community that still didn't have water that were able to come to our campuses and shower and come to our campuses and fill up water jugs so that they could go back home uh, and come to our campuses to pick up food because they didn't have food. And uh, when you look at our school lunches, we served more school lunches on that Monday after we were out for the freeze than any day previous to that in the history of Conroe ISD, which showed us there was a need for food uh, in our community that day. And I'm really proud that we were able to be there and stand uh, with and stand for our community 
in that big time of need. And since then, our school lunches remain high, which tells us there's still a need out there. It's still people are struggling um, with not only the COVID situation, but also still maybe trying to get their house back to normal um, with the freeze. But we're proud to be here and be a part of helping you get well through that process. So we're thankful for that. Now, big news today and a big celebration that that's going to that just got confirmed this afternoon is graduations and so you saw us scrolling before um, the uh, we started this evening a graphic that showed you the graduation dates and we can throw it back up there but here are our graduation dates for our high schools and we have now confirmed today um, the location of graduation for most of our high schools and we are able to move back to what is um, really our normal situation for graduation. So Oak Ridge High School and Conroe High School, the Woodlands College Park, the Woodlands High School and Grand Oaks High School are all confirmed. Uh, they, will con they will occur on the date posted there and they will be at the Cynthia Woods Mitchell Pavilion in the Woodlands. And we are excited about that. Every student will receive at least four tickets uh, for the covered seating there at the pavilion. And then we will have additional seating available on the lawn, uh, which will also allow for some social, more social distancing as uh, people feel comfortable. But we are excited to make that announcement. Washington and Caney Creek, we're still working on your sites. Uh, Caney Creek, you're scheduled to go to Sam Houston. We're waiting to get confirmation uh, from them if they are going to be able to accommodate us. If they are not able to accommodate us at Sam Houston, then we will work uh, you into the pavilion as well. And uh, we'll shoot for that same date. If we need to make an adjustment, then we will. And then the same for you at Washington High School. Uh, our target will be that same date. We're looking for the appropriate venue. As you know, we typically um, would host you in the Conroe High School Auditorium um, because it might feel a little overcrowded in there. We are looking for a slightly larger venue. Uh, it's you know, the potential that we, we could be a variety of places. So once we have that confirmed, we will let you know, but I'm excited to tell you uh, that we will have graduations and we look forward to celebrating the class of 2021. So congratulations, seniors. I hope that gives you relief to know that graduations are happening and we're excited to celebrate those with you. Uh, another big piece of news came out this week that was a celebration for us. TEA, our, our agency that guides all the public schools in Texas, uh, released a report that talked about uh, the percentage of students that are learning face-to-face -face in Texas school districts. So you know we have students that have the, the choice right now, you can be face-to-face, -face, you can be remote. And for those students that choose remote and it works for them, it's wonderful. Uh, but for many families, that's not an option that works for them. They really need the face-to-face -face option. Well, TEA's report that was released took the 25 largest school districts in the state by student population. Uh, this year, we are the 10th largest school district in the state. Um, so we are included in that list of the, of the 25 largest. Of those 25 largest, we have the largest percentage of students learning face-to-face -face on campus of any of the top 25 school districts in the state. That's something that we take a lot of pride in. I think that shows that our community has a lot of trust in our safety protocols. Uh, it shows that our staff is doing a wonderful job of implementing, implementing them. Uh, we're, we're doing our work. You know, just from the time we opened school until now, we've had over 12,000 students make the shift from virtual to face-to-face. So to give you a little perspective on that, our percentage of face-to-face uh, of -face learners is roughly 40% higher than that of Fort Bend ISD, which is a very similar school district to us. It's over 20% higher, or right at 20% higher face-to-face -face than Cypher or Katy or Klein. So it's significant. And uh, we couldn't do it without all the hard work of everybody that's that's doing what they're doing in our school district to make it happen. But we take a lot of pride uh, in that. So that's a celebration for us as well. I'm really proud to say that I, I believe we are one of the largest na uh, school districts in the nation that have been open all year long and have never once closed a grade level, a school, or the district. Since we opened full speed, we have been wide open uh, every day. Uh, 
except for the freeze and all the other things that have come with it. But due to COVID, we have not had to, to have a closure. And I, and I do believe we're one of the largest districts in the nation that can say that. So another big piece of pride for us here in Conroe ISD that, that that's a community thing. It's not just what we're doing in the school district that's part of the community. We should all be really proud of that. Now, along with that pride uh, comes this realization that it's not easy. Um, if it looks easy from the outside, I would tell you that we, that um, we might be fooling you a little bit because it's absolutely not an easy thing to do. Um, it's very difficult. It requires not only those cleaning strategies, but the contact tracing and the communications and all the pieces that come together to make it happen are really hard. And being so big and having so many people in our schools every day, staying open can't be taken for granted. It's really fragile. Um, we've had our moments, I will tell you, and some of you have experienced moments with transportation. We had a few weeks there really coming out of Christmas that we had really large struggles with transportation. Many bus drivers out required us to double up some routes and some of you felt that, that pain as much as we tried not to have you feel it. We had a couple of campuses that really in January and moving into February were on the ropes. We, we had large questions about would they stay open or would we end up having to close them for a few weeks to allow the numbers of student cases to go down and to allow us to get our staff back. So we were really in a fragile position and the freeze probably saved us maybe in a couple of places. Um, so we can't take it for granted. We look across the nation, you know, you see school districts that are still trying to figure out how to open. Uh, I was reading an article the other day about the Boston Public Schools. Uh, they're about 10,000 students smaller than us. So that's hard to believe in its own right that the Boston Public Schools are that much smaller than we are, but they are. But I was reading this article and it was talking about how they're working really hard to get their schools open. And I think this week uh, they, they're welcoming their kindergartners through third graders back to school for the first time. And that amazes me that they're just now getting to this point. Uh, but it also makes me stop and think, wow, how fortunate are we? Uh, how fortunate are we to be in school? As perfect, as imperfect as it may be, how fortunate are we to be there each and every day? And so we appreciate that and we, we do want to celebrate it. Now for the best news that I can give you tonight. Um, through all these processes that we've gone through, um, in the last week, and we'll talk about them at length here in just a few minutes. We've talked to a lot of experts uh, about COVID and about our community and our rate of vaccinations and our rate of infection and how does this translate into the future. The most positive news, and if, if, you, if you need something to grab a hold of as hope, I hope this is it for you tonight. Everyone all the experts tell me that by early to midsummer, our community is going to be back to normal. That brings me so much joy. That has allowed us now to shift every bit of our planning internally for next year is planning to open school with none of these restrictions. So our plan right now uh, is to open next school year wide open, no restrictions, normal school. And I hope that brings you joy and relief. And I will be honest and tell you that it brings me a ton of joy and relief to know that we are reaching the end of this. Uh, it feels like it's been forever. It's been right about a year since the first time uh, we kind of came together in this format. Uh, but to know that the end is really near, we're, we, are, we, are, we are approaching the end, man, it feels good. And so I hope it makes you feel good too. I have a lot of other information to share with you tonight, but none of it is as good as that. That's the best news I can give you tonight. And so, um, you know, let that, let that kind of wash over you. And I hope that it does bring you uh, a lot of peace and joy as we look to move forward. And we, we find ourselves tonight uh, at another one of those difficult situations that we have found ourselves in uh, many times over the last year, right? A, a situation where we have a lot of um, conversation and, 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 decisions to make and how will we move forward and what will we do? And I will tell you that we can do this, right? We have dealt with so much over the last year. We've dealt with floods and social injustice and social unrest. 
uh, elections, freezes, uh, everything else associated with this pandemic. We have proven that we can do hard things, right? So I have no question that we are going to successfully finish this school year. And we're not going to survive the last nine weeks of school. That's not what it's about. It's about thriving as we finish this school year. And we begin to work ourselves towards that normal feeling so that we hit next year and we are ready to run. So we can do hard things. We've proven it as a community that we can. And that's, that's what we're going to do now. And we're going we're gonna to keep pushing forward. So we will get through this last nine weeks. We will thrive. We will be successful. And it's going to be wonderful. And as I got ready to talk to you tonight, I went back to previous notes to, to look at what we had talked about in the past, to think about what we would share tonight. And I actually went back to my notes from July 23rd. I don't remember which, which number update that was. It was Ju the July 23rd update uh, was the night that we came on and we talked about our reopening plan. It was the night that we shared that there was going to be a few week delay and then we were going to do the ramp up, if you remember all that from way back uh, early in the fall semester. And I will tell you, at that point, um, we were really uh, just trying to build it. Uh, it was like building the airplane as you fly it. You, you hear that phrase. Uh, because there was no example out there for us as to how to run schools successfully and keep it safe and keep it open. That example didn't exist. We were creating it ourselves. Uh, with the hopes that it would work. And we came on that night and we told you that we had really spent our time and efforts talking to the experts and really analyzing it. And we were confident that it was going to work. And we told you that. And we told you we were going to open. And we told you that we were going to stay open. And we made that promise to you. And we've kept that promise. And so I went back to those notes and I found some interesting um, pieces that were in that. And so I just left them. And I just want to read them to you tonight. Uh, because they absolutely still apply today. We, we're, here we are, we're kind of in the exact same situation where maybe everyone's not going to agree with what we're doing, but in the end, if we can have school open and kids can be in school learning successfully, that's our ultimate goal. So a few of the notes that we made and that I talked about then from July 23rd that still apply today. Kindness, hope, and positivity, they all still matter. Right? They're all still very important, um, and, and we, need to, we need to give that example to our children as well. Our two main principles, which we've shared at almost every one of these updates, if not all of them, they have not changed. We're still rooted in our principles of protect the community and protect the school year. Those, those were our two main principles on July 23rd. They remain our two main principles today. Flexibility and grace are important. Then we talked about you have to be prepared for anything. Be prepared for closures. Be prepared for um, inconveniences and disruptions. And we've, we've seen those with the transportation. We've, those things, have we've, we've had to deal with those a little bit, but we've done our best to handle them. We also said that night we made a pledge and a promise to you as a community and as parents. We said that we will not waver on our focus for safety. And we hold that promise true today. I also made a note here to talk to you as a dad that day. And I said, decision making for a dad, for me as an individual dad and as a parent, is very different than decision making for 65,000 kids and 10,500 full and part-time employees. And we mentioned that night that hope is not a plan right? If we fail to have a plan, if we fail to think through all the consequences of what may happen, and we fail, and we cause schools to close, you will be much more mad at us in that moment for failing to plan and failing to have a plan than you are right now. And I believe that was true then. I believe it's still true today. The last thing that we mentioned that night that still holds really uh, strongly true today, it's our intention, our plan, is built to honor those that want the option of face-to-face -face instruction. 
That's how we built that previous plan. We wanted to make sure that we could build a plan that kept our schools open. So if you as a parent wanted your child in face-to-face -face instruction, you would have that option. That still remains true today. We want you to have that option. If you want your child to be at face-to-face -face instruction, we want you to have that as an option. And that's where our plan is. We were focused in that moment of, uh, we said it over and over again, we want to open and we want to stay open. And here we are from that moment, we have held that promise and we're going to hold it through the end of this school year that we are going to remain open at all of our campuses. And we talked about how last year uh, when so many districts were struggling and so many people could not figure out how to honor their graduates, we, we sort of hung our hat on the fact that last year in May, we found a way to honor our graduates in person. We found a way to have our graduates walk across the stage and receive their diploma. And not only did we do that, but we also were able to help other districts that didn't have a way of doing that. We allowed them to use our way in our stadium so that their students could be honored. And we proved that we could do it. And that's what gave us the confidence in July to know that we could do what we said we were gonna do in September, and we did it. And the fact that we did that in September gives us that confidence to know that we can do exactly what we're setting out to do today and we can do it so successfully and we can make it the best that it can be for children and we can have great learning going on in our schools and we can finish this school year very strongly. So when I think about where we are today, if you would have told me in July, if you'd have given me the scenario that we're in today, if you'd have said in July, look, we're going to get you to March and it's going to be going so well by March that we're going to be in a, the middle of a debate about changing our pro, your, your protocols for the remainder of the year because you will have done it so successfully to that point. I would have taken that in a heartbeat and said, I will take that problem. So um, while we have to work our way through this, I'm not going to be um, unappreciative of the fact that we are where we are. I appreciate the fact that we're having this conversation. Uh, I think we're fortunate to be having it and, and I think we should appreciate that. So let's talk about where we are and, and, and how we've gotten here. And it's very similar to that July 23rd conversation. We, we use the same experts to talk to and we've gone through our same processes and we're gonna go through and talk about this. Uh, the difference from July is when we did this in July, we weren't sure if it would work. It was a guess. And here we are in March. We know it works. We've proven it. So it's a much more comfortable position to be working from um, than it was back then. Now, I wish that there was some rule or, or, or something that I could do to make, just make COVID go away right now. Uh, I wish I could do that. I wish there was something I could do to make everyone happy and just back to normal. Unfortunately, that's just not where we are yet. There, there is no way to do that today. We're still in the middle of the pandemic. We still have to work through this pandemic and we have to find our solutions and we will. Uh, so there is no way for me just to make it be gone. I wish I could. It, it brings me no joy to, to have, uh, you know, to see our community fight with each other on social media. Um, it saddens me, truthfully. Um, you know, but, but we respect everyone's opinion. You know, I think when we think about this social media world, we, we get caught up into the things that, that the ways we see the world differently. We don't spend enough time thinking about the things that we agree on. You know, you, you rarely see a thread on social media where everybody just starts listing, like, here's all the things we agree on. No, it's usually we find one thing we don't agree on and then we, we, we turn that and it just gets ugly. And I think we're better than that. Uh, I know our kids need us to be better than that. They need us to be a better example uh, than that. So let's talk about what we agree on. I think this is universal from everybody that works here to everybody that I've had the chance to talk to over the last uh, week or so about this topic. There are things that we all agree on. Number one, we all wish this was over. N nobody wants us to be in this situation. We all wish this was over. We're all sick of masks. We're all sick of not being able to carry on our normal lives. Every single one of us is tired of that. Uh, I think it's a universal feeling that we all want our kids to be safe. As parents, that's what we all want that. Now, everybody might have a, a little differing opinion about what it takes to achieve that, but we all want that. We all want our kids to be safe. 
And the other thing I believe we all agree on is everybody wants our schools to be open. Nobody wants us to close school again and go back to this forced virtual learning that we had really starting about a year ago this week. Those are all things that we agree on. They're, they're universal things that we agree on and we should, we should feel comfortable in our own skin to agree on those things. Now, over the last week, I've had a chance to talk to a lot of people, um, a lot of really good people. And um, it's sad when these things, when, when we, we have controversy and it, and it gets everyone's emotions up, I don't like that. Um, but it is, the, the nice part about that is it does give me a chance to talk to a lot of community members and it reinforces the fact that we live in a wonderful place. And I get to talk to good people uh, who have varying opinions uh, and some that agree with what we do and some that disagree with what we do, but it goes back to those things that we all have in common. Even when I talk to people that disagree with the decisions that we made, we have wonderful conversations, good people. And in the end, we might end up disagreeing um, on some of the, the routes that we may take, but, but we never disagree on those tenants that we all agree on, right? That we want our kids safe and we want our schools open. We all agree on those things and we're, and we're tired of COVID. We all agree. If I had to categorize the, the groups of people that I've heard from, that we've heard from really in this past week, right? Either through phone calls or emails or comments to the, um, you know, to social media or, or comments to our website, there's really kind of three different groups that, that are out there. And all three groups have valid opinions. And if you're convinced that everyone in the world agrees with your opinion, I'll, that, that's the one place I'll tell you you're wrong. Uh, there is no single opinion that, that everyone agrees with. There, there are very strong opinions all across the board, but we have kind of three groups that, that have kind of shaken out. One group is a group that feels very strongly that um, our students and staff should not be wearing masks, that it's time to take off the mask and move forward without masks. We have another group that feels very strongly that we should keep our masking protocols. Um, they have a variety of, of their reasons for that, but they feel very strongly that now is not the time to take off masks. And then there's a third group that probably doesn't have super strong feelings either way. They may have a, a, a lean one way or the other, but their real strongest feelings are, we don't really care what your decision is with masks, but you better not do anything that closes the schools because my family cannot tolerate and cannot handle schools being closed again and my children cannot go back to that environment so don't do anything that's going to cause our schools to close because my kids have to be in school so all three very valid opinions we respect them all we've heard them all i will tell you if you, if you feel like your voice hasn't been heard i can assure you that it that that's not the case we've heard all of those opinions and we respect each and every one of them and they have played a role in our conversations over the last week as we've moved forward to our current plan. So let's talk about where we are and how we've gotten here. And I, I'm gonna to try to make my former high school English teachers proud and uh, share with you some primary sources tonight so that you can see exactly what we see. Uh, and once again, I'm gonna give you more detail than many of you may want, but uh, I just really wanna to try to walk you through this process of how we got to this conversation tonight and when it started and, and how we got here. Okay, so I'm gonna share with you the sources where I can. I'm gonna talk you through some of the other details um, with the decision-making process. And hopefully when this is done, you may still not agree with the, with the decision that's made, but I do hope that you will understand the process. You will understand all the things that we had to take into account that perhaps you haven't had a chance yet to consider or, or know. And at least you will know how and why the decision was made, even if you can't be completely on board with it. So let's go back and we're gonna kind of just follow this in chronological order to the best we can. Uh, so we go back to March 2nd and Governor Abbott issued his executive order that is commonly referred to as ending the mask mandate across Texas. And that was one of the numbers that was included in the executive order, but the executive order had many different line items. It wasn't just, there'll be no masks in Texas. That's not what his executive order said. And here's a copy of the executive order the, that you can see. And number six uh, on the executive order said, public schools may operate as provided by, 
and under the minimum standard health protocols found in guidance issued by the Texas Education Agency. So at that point, you got an email from us that said, hey, we, we understand the governor has uh, made his announcement on his executive order. We are not sure uh, what we're going to do yet. We are waiting guidance from TEA because that's exactly what we were directed to do uh, in his executive order. So we could not answer the question, but that began the conversations, right? So on March 2nd, we began to have a lot of different conversations, and that's when um, really began to engage with people with all different opinions uh, on this matter. And we've had wonderful conversations. I'll share with you one of the great conversations that I had was um, with one of our local elected leaders, Congressman Kevin Brady. Uh, he even uh, went as far as to tweet. Uh, I think we have a copy of his tweet. You can see his tweet that he put out after a, uh, a, a very great conversation that he and I had. You know, Congressman Brady, as he mentioned in his tweet, he's not just our congressman and, and a high-ranking congressman at that. It represents us very well in Washington, D.C. He's also a Conroe ISD parent, just like you and just like me. Um, and you can see in his tweet, as a parent of a Conroe ISD senior, it's smart to keep proven, common-sense safety measures in place as we work through COVID. It's why in-class learning, which is so crucial for our kids, works successfully in Texas. It allows more school activities, too. So we heard from a lot of people. Kevin Brady was one of those that we heard from, and it's nice to hear from him. As we continued moving forward on March 4th, uh, Governor Abbott was, uh, did an interview here in locally in the Houston area on Channel 13, and you can see a link directly to uh, a quote that came directly from his uh, interview. This was a direct, direct source from Governor Abbott. In regard to the mask mandate, we are still urging people to continue to wear the mask, to continue to use the safe practices they have mastered this past year. Because Texans have mastered the safe strategies, they know the right thing to do. And I'll remind you that he told us in the executive order to follow the guidance from TEA. So the next primary source I'm going to share for you is that guidance from TEA. This is linked on our website. You can see exactly what we see. We want you to see that. We try to be as transparent as we can with you. Well, you can see on this guidance that was updated on March 4th, 2021. So once again, uh, TEA is led by the Commissioner of Education that is appointed by Governor Abbott. So this is directly from um, the governor's team. Um, and you can see here, um, health hygiene practices, mass. Um, schools must comply with the following requirements. You can see there at number two, and I'm not going to read you the whole thing. I, I, I won't, but number two says, every student, teacher, or staff member shall wear a mask when inside the school building or school facility. That is the guidance that came from TEA, from Governor Abbott's um, a cabinet level position on March 4th. Uh, so that didn't change. The guidance didn't change for us from the governor or from TEA uh, as uh, a result of either the executive order or the new TEA guidance regarding masks. It didn't change. The only change that, that occurred is they added a bullet at the bottom that says the governing body may modify or limit by formal action the mask related requirements. So they did give the option that if we wanted not to follow it, we could, but it didn't change the fact that they said, if you want schools to be safe and open, you will follow the guidance. What they also didn't give here is any opportunity to opt out of everything else that's associated with COVID. The biggest one being quarantine. And we'll talk a little bit more about quarantine later, but our quarantine rules are tied very heavily to the masking rules. And you, while you could opt out of masking, you can't opt out of quarantine. And I'm gonna share with you in just a bit what that would mean for us uh, moving forward without masks. Um, so the next big piece that we had, we got that TA guidance on Wednesday. Uh, we also had a public health board meeting on Wednesday. That's a board that I sit on, and I had an opportunity to interview uh, directly to Dr. Charles Sims, the Montgomery County Public Health Authority. And I had a list of 10 to 12 questions based on the questions you were asking me. I wanted to ask him all of the questions you had, and I, and I asked those questions. You know, does he believe 
that schools have been successful? And he said yes. And he was speaking for the whole county, and he specifically in his presentation pointed out that Conroe ISD, above every other district, has been the most successful school district in implementing protocols, keeping their schools open, and keeping their children in school. Uh, I asked specifically, um, does he recommend at this time that we change our mass protocols? And he said, no. We need to continue with what we are doing that's kept us safe. I asked specifically, if my number one goal as a superintendent is to keep our schools open, if we change our mass protocols, am I putting my number one goal in peril? And he said unequivocally, yes. You would be uh, putting yourself at risk for closing either classes, grade levels, or total schools or the district if you change your protocols at this time. So we asked those hard questions at that public health meeting. Later in the week, we had an opportunity to meet with our PTA President's Council. And it's a, the, all of the PTA presidents from across the, uh, the school district on a Zoom and the principals joined us. And we went through all of these scenarios with them and we asked for you know, their opinion. And 96% of that committee indicated to us that we needed to keep our protocols. Uh, we then received a Montgomery County Public Health Guidance Letter, which we had up on the screen just a moment ago. We can put it back up. Uh, late last week, we received that guidance from Montgomery County Public Health. And that this new guidance will be linked up on our website. You can go and see this directly for yourself as well. And once again, they make the point here in the language on the first page that if you want your schools to remain open, if that is your number one priority, then you should not change your protocols that have allowed you to get to this point. The second page of that document has more bullets and really kind of highlights the individual items that need to be done. This is not, this is not really changed from their August guidance that they gave us. Um, it's very similar. So really nothing has changed from them either. So our guidance from TEA has not changed. Our guidance from Montgomery County Public Health has not changed for us uh, in the last week. Um, late last week, we also had a meeting of a committee that's called the SHAC Committee. You've probably never heard of the SHAC Committee. It's the School Health Advisory Committee here in, in the school district. And so this is a group of, it has parents, teachers, um, healthcare professionals, uh, community members. It's a large group. Then they're usually considering things like our health curriculum or health initiatives across the district. But we brought this conversation to them. Once again, we wanted to do our due diligence and make sure that we have talked to a lot of people through this process and didn't just rush to a judgment so that you wouldn't feel like you weren't heard and we didn't give it um, all the consideration that we could. So we convened a meeting of that School Health Advisory SHAC Committee. We made the presentation to that committee. Unanimously, that committee told us that we should keep our same protocols that we have today. Following that group, we went to our reopening committee. So this is the same committee that helped us build our roadmap to reopening, uh, helped us with that ramp up plan, has helped build all the protocols throughout the year that have helped us be so successful, helped us to open and stay open. We made the same presentation to the reopening committee and 96% once again of the reopening committee told us that we should keep our current protocols in place. Following that, we took this conversation to an emergency meeting of our district level planning and decision making committee. Once again, it is a committee uh, that is made up of parents, teachers, community members, community leaders, um, healthcare experts, um, and, and I'll, I'll go back and say our <clears throat> reopening committee also has multiple physicians and healthcare experts on it as well. Our district level planning committee, we, we brought the conversation to them, as I said, uh, yesterday, and that group unanimously um, supported keeping our current protocols in place. So we have taken this now to four different internal groups that are made up of parents, community leaders, uh, and healthcare experts. And of the four groups, the lowest percentage that, that asked us to keep them in place was 96%, with two of them being 100%. Additionally, we went back to review the CDC language regarding safe school openings, and their language remains the same. The CDC says 
um, the mitigation strategies to reduce the transmission in schools, if you're going to have face to face, the first bullet is universal and correct wearing of masks. So that also has not changed. So all of that information is what led us to yesterday's email that went out that the decision has been made that we will continue to wear masks for the remainder of this school year uh, when inside our, our CISD facility. So hopefully that paints that picture and it gets us to today's conversation and you can see how that has traveled. It has not been um, taken lightly. It has not been any decision that was made on a whim. Uh, it involved a lot of stakeholders and a lot of conversation and really great conversation. Um, but it's brought us to this point. And so let's, let's kind of talk about the why now a little, a little more so you can get a little bit more of the details. Um, our two principles that we've, we've held our hat on for the entire time, right, is protect our community and protect the school year, right? Those are, our, uh, those are really the, the, the two things that everything has been built on um, over the last nine months or so. So our primary goal is to keep schools open. We know the formula of keeping schools open. We've done it now. We've proven it. While other people across the country are still trying to figure it out, I still don't understand why they won't just call us. We'll be happy to tell them. But we've proven it. We know how to do this at this point. For those of you that, that are concerned or question, you know, you're not following the governor's order. I hope that now that you've seen from those primary sources, we are absolutely following the governor's order. We are absolutely following the advice that we've been given by our elected leaders, that, that it's not the case that we are trying to act outside of what's been recommended to us. I hope that you can see that now. Uh, as we mentioned, the quarantine rules have not changed. Let's talk about quarantine a little bit. If you haven't had to experience it yet as a parent, um, be thankful because it's a painful process. Um, when someone has been determined to be in close contact with someone that has tested positive, they are forced to quarantine for at least 10 days up to 14 days. Man, they can't come to school or not supposed to be out in the community. They must go home. Um, we've had to quarantine a lot of students and a lot of employees during this year. You can go to our COVID dashboard and you can see those exact numbers. We publish it for you every day. It's very public. You can see it. Um, I will tell you that oftentimes when we have to call to quarantine somebody, those aren't pleasant conversations. Um, people are very upset when we tell them that their children are not allowed to come to school for the next two or three weeks. It's, it's really very difficult. Um, but the quarantine rules are given to us by um, local health experts. It's, those are not our rules. We don't get to pick those rules. And they're not rules that we can opt out of, as I mentioned. The quarantine rules are tied very heavily to masks. And what I mean by that is, um, if you're determined to be a close contact, then you must quarantine. But the definition of close contact is determined by your mask wearing. If you are wearing a mask and the other person is wearing a mask, you are not deemed a close contact, which means you are not asked or forced to quarantine. So you get to continue to come to school. If you were unmasked in that situation, you would automatically be quarantined. If you were in a classroom and anybody in the classroom tested positive and you were not, your child was not masked, you would automatically be quarantined in that situation. Once again, not our choice, but it, it, that's just the reality. So let's run an example of that. Let's take uh, a student at a, uh, maybe a junior high that, that I had a conversation with a lovely family earlier today and um, we, we talked through this scenario with their, um, with their family at a junior high that runs a four period day. Okay, let's say we were to remove our masking um, expectations and um, for the sake of argument, let's say a third of the kids uh, chose not to wear masks. Okay, and this to make the math easy, let's assume there are 30 kids in every class. All right, uh, so on Monday and Tuesday, a child comes to school and they were kind of symptomatic, weren't feeling great, but they came to school Well, Wednesday, they decided to go get tested and they test positive. The county is going to alert us and they say, we have a student that has tested positive. In our current scenario, we send that information to the teachers. The teachers look at it and say, okay, every one of my class has been wearing a mask, no close contacts, nobody gets quarantined. You get a letter from us that just lets you know that somebody was 
uh, tested positive in your, in your child's class, but you're not asked to quarantine because you're not considered a close contact. If a third of the students had chosen not to wear a mask, and that child went to four classes on Monday and then four different classes on Tuesday, uh, and we're assuming 30 students in a class, then 10 kids in every class would have to be quarantined based on that one positive. So we would be making phone calls on Wednesday to 80, let's see, uh, 80 students that would have to be quarantined for the next two weeks to three weeks based on that one positive test, 80 students. Now, I have a high school student, certainly high school students are different. I've had days as a parent where I've received notification from the school district that has said five individuals in my child's school have tested positive today. In that scenario where one positive sends, sends 80 children home, we could have a situation where 400 students get quarantined in one day. I'm going to tell you that we don't have the capability to absorb that. Like if we had 400 students in a single day get quarantined for the next two weeks, our teachers cannot be asked to teach 400 students online that now they have to be remote learners for two weeks and still try to maintain what's going on in their classroom. Um, meanwhile, that's just one day and one child's worth of quarantine. There, there could be or, or, or one, one day of five children. There could be other days and more. We can't maintain that. And it, you can see how quickly we would find ourselves at a point where we would have sent so many students home, it's hard to have school. And not to mention if these students are perhaps their parents or teachers, or if, um, if they're in a situation where teachers are considered close contact and they get sent home, you can see how quickly this tide could turn and we could close just based on the quarantine rules. And once again, we can't opt out of those. So I hope that you can see how that the masking and the quarantine are directly related to each other. Now, now we can argue scientifically if you think masks work or you don't, or if we think three years from now, there's going to be a study that says, you know, we didn't need to be masking. We didn't need to be quarantining. That's all debatable. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not a medical expert. I'm not even here to debate that. I can only tell you that what I know to be a fact is if we remove our mask guidance, we will exponentially increase the number of students that are in quarantine. And every single student that gets sent to quarantine is a child that wanted to be a face-to-face -face learner that has now lost their opportunity to do that at what I would argue may be the most important instructional time of the year here as we wrap up the school year. Now, another thing that maybe you haven't given too much thought about is that today everyone went to school or went to remote school because of the choice they've made based on our current protocols. So our 65,000 students, everybody landed where they wanted to land today based on these protocols. If we make a significant change in the protocol, I believe it's, it's uh, we can expect people to change their decision. Uh, since the school year started, as I mentioned earlier, 12,000 students have joined us that started the school year remotely and have now, through watching the system go, feeling more comfortable with our protocols, they've moved into in-person instruction. Not to mention the number of students that may have chosen in-person instruction from the very day one because they believed in the protocol. I think it's very safe to assume if we make a change to our protocol at this time that we would have thousands, if not tens of thousands, students and families making a choice to leave face-to-face -face instruction and go back to virtual. Now you may be sitting there thinking, fine, that's not, I don't care. That doesn't affect me. I, I'm going to make my choice. I don't care. But we all have to care about that because if 10 or 12,000 or 15,000 students were to switch after spring break from face-to-face -to, -face to remote learning, then we would have to completely change our master schedule at every campus. So that might mean that your child or my child, their, their English teacher might have to be converted from a face-to-face -face teacher to a remote teacher when we return back from spring break, which means for the last nine weeks, your child might have a new English teacher. 
your child might have a new kindergarten teacher or pre-K teacher as we have to adjust and make changes. Your child's complete schedule could change based on that. And we don't have the bandwidth to make all those changes right now. Um, it will create chaos and confusion, uh, not only for those that are going back to remote learning, which um, is not the choice they want to make, but that would be the choice they felt like they were forced to make, uh, but it would also um, create a negative impact on the educational opportunities of every single child in Conroe ISD if we were to make that change. One of the other things that people don't often think about with us is we're not just a, um, the deliverer of educational opportunities for children, we are also by far the largest employer in Montgomery County. Uh, when you consider our full-time and part-time employees, that would include our substitute teachers, we employ over 10,500 people in the county. And just like at your job, we have a human resources department and we have uh, responsibilities and obligations that we owe to our employees, just like your job has those things that they owe to you. And so for all of our employees, once again, um, and we had quite a few that didn't return this year because of COVID or because of um, things that maybe they didn't agree with with our protocols. But for all of those that came to work today and yesterday and, and have been for the whole year, they have come to work under the assumption of our current protocols. And they have made that decision with their family. They have made that decision with their physician that this is the plan that they want um, for them and, and that they feel safe in this situation. But we also have to look at this as an employer. Uh, if we make a drastic change to protocols today, uh, it's very reasonable to think that our employees would need to reevaluate their current situation. They would need to make a decision with their family, many with their physician, to determine if this is still something that they feel safe with, if it still feels like a good idea, if it's something that they still want to do. If we make a significant change in the protocols and we have teachers or bus drivers that no longer feel safe and choose to leave us here in the middle of the year, once again, terrible negative impacts for the educational opportunities of our children. Uh, subs would be an area that I believe that we would really struggle with because th they don't have to work every day. And if they began to feel like they couldn't be safe and chose to quit coming, uh, we could quickly find ourselves unable to keep a school open because we didn't have enough substitute teachers when we had teachers out. So that puts a big danger into our school year uh, closing once again. So those are all different things that we've had to consider. And, and you may have considered all those things, uh, but maybe you haven't. And I hope that you can kind of see this bigger global picture that occurs uh, as we look at this. So to kind of go back uh, a little bit and look at the big picture here too, every single group of experts that we've talked to in the last week, TEA, CDC, Montgomery County Public Health, all of the physicians that are on our groups have told us, don't change your protocol. You wanna keep school open, don't change your protocol. All of our internal groups that are parents, community members, experts in the field, all of them have said, don't change your protocols. We've missed so much in this last year. There's a whole semester or a whole nine weeks from last year that we missed and we are on, on, now on the verge of having that. We missed all the special events from the end of last year. We missed baseball and soccer and the end of the year activities. We missed all of that last year. And I will tell you, this is where it comes down to, I have a decision that I have to make um, regarding this school district. And once again, it's very different to make decisions for 65,000 and make decisions for families that I know absolutely cannot survive if we close school because they, they're gonna struggle to feed their family and they're gonna struggle because they have to go to work. Uh, and so I know the impact that it would have if we had to close school again, not to mention the academic danger that it causes. We know those dangers uh, as well, and they are significant. When you take all that into account and you take all of the reasons why 
this decision could put this school year in jeopardy. And you take all of the, the information that we've given or we've been given from experts, for us to sit here and say that we want to ignore all of that and, and we're going to gamble the school year, that's just not a gamble I'm willing to make on the lives of our students, on the lives of our employees, on the livelihood of your family. We have proven that we can have school and it can work with masks. And it's not perfect and I won't tell you that it is, but I will tell you that I, I'm in schools a lot and kids are joyous and kids are having great days at school and kids look like they should look in school and they're, and they're enjoying it. It's not perfect and we might be missing some of those nonverbal cues. I won't argue that. But they're getting so much more than they would be getting if we quarantine them for two weeks. Or they're getting so much more than they would get if we risked this and forced our schools to be closed down the road. So it's just not a gamble that we can take right now. So that's how we've gotten to this point. That's what's gotten us here. Um, for many of you, like I said, you like all that detail, you like all that information, you want to, to know it at a deeper level. Um, and, and for those of you that it's just too much, I, I, I respect that and understand it as well. Um, but to go back to what we talked about at the very beginning, people ask, well, you know, but for how long, when does this end? It ends this year. Okay. This is how we finish this year. And then we're, we are through this and we can do this for one more grading period and we then we can be done and we can do it. I believe in it. Now, this also takes us to a very exciting point because what, so what can we do? So you're saying, listen, we can't give up the masking protocol because that's what's keeping us open. Well, then what can we do? How do we start to get back to normal? Because we all want normal. So what can we do to start getting back to normal? And we've been working on this for a few weeks as we started seeing numbers go down. And as we've started to become more and more comfortable with some of the protocols and the ways that we function, we have uh, things tonight that I'm happy and excited to share with you that are going to start working their way back to more normal. And uh, we'll start it with um, outdoor events. And once again, the, the reason we can do this is because we're keeping the masking protocol in our buildings, right? If we didn't have that, we would not feel comfortable about making any of these other changes. So all of these changes are a direct result of that. So the first one I'll talk about is outdoor events. So we are now going mask optional, no longer required mask optional at outdoor events. So our most common outdoor events right now are baseball games and soccer games, softball, um, track meets. So for those of you in the stands, it's now mask optional. Now I'll ask you like in your, in the common areas, you know, to be courteous to others. When you're going to the concession stand, to be courteous to whoever's working in the concession stand to wear your mask. But when you're in the stands and you have a chance to spread out, enjoy the spring weather, total respect, okay? The, the masks now are optional for those events. Um, we feel like for that and for all of these items, we're not making any changes that we feel like have a chance to um, derail our school year, right? So for those of you that are worried and right now there, I know there are some of you out there like, oh my gosh, don't make decisions that, that could, that could mess up this school year. We're not, I can, I can assure you that we've vetted all of these ideas through all the experts and we feel very confident with these. So outdoor events, mass are optional. We've, we have talked to coaches to make sure that, you know, when kids are in the dugouts or traveling or all that, the quarantine rules still apply. So we don't want you know, somebody's softball team to get quarantined, so they still need to be smart in those situations. But when they're out on the field and they're competing, um, I think we've, we've proven now, we've seen that that's a safe opportunity to not be in a mask and for parents in the stands to not be in a mask. So we're, we're excited about that change. The same with recess. We talked about recess earlier in the year and, and working with you on that, we're at a point and we know this, that, you know, kids can be out at recess actively playing without a mask and they'll be fine. We'll just ask them to put their mask back on before they enter back into the building. Now, if they're out at recess and they're just kind of buddied up with their friends and they're not really running around and playing, then they should wear a mask because that puts them in danger of being quarantined, having a close conversation without a mask. And we don't want to have to make that phone call and quarantine them. So, but if they're out there running and they're playing and they're active, they'll be able, they, they can take their mask off. It's going to be fine. 
and, and we believe it to be safe. Now, if you disagree with that and you want to tell your child you should wear your mask at all times, never take it off, we respect that too. Okay, that, that, that would be fine. Another big change that we are now working towards is allowing parent volunteers back into the building. So we will begin to work through this process and uh, allow a limited number of parent volunteers back into the building. Um, and, and we can do that. We won't have you in classrooms around kids so that we don't take that chance. But we know that you play such a vital role uh, in the functioning of our building and not really just the functioning, but just the morale. It's just knowing that you're there and you care for the teachers and you support them. It means so much to us. And so um, to have you back present will mean a lot and we feel that we can safely do that now um, so you know i would encourage you to talk to your principal and your principals will be having those conversations with you about what that's going to look like moving forward you know we're also talking to our teachers about instructional strategies in the classroom um, you know making sure that we get back to what we know is good instruction uh, that we can do safely if we're in mass like small group instruction where we bring small groups of children up to work with the teachers. We know that we can do that safely with students in mass and cooperative learning where students can interact with each other in the classrooms. I know we, we all desire that interaction. We can do that safely now. We're gonna, we're gonna begin to move and do more and more of that so that the classroom instruction feels more and more normal here as we continue through the year. On campus activities, we have, we have really become comfortable with some on-campus activities um, through the late fall semester and into the spring semester. We've proven that we can have indoor activities, be it athletic events or fine arts events, and we have the proper protocols in place to do that safely. So now how do we do that? We had a meeting today with principals and we have encouraged principals to pull out what is normally those end of school activities, the last nine weeks activities at your school, and let's figure out how to do them safely with, with protocols, but let's figure out how to do them now moving into this last nine weeks. And that looks different everywhere, right? Some campuses have big field days. Some campuses have kindergarten graduation. Some campuses have uh, fourth grade clap out celebration for students that are moving on into intermediate school. Whatever it is at your campus that makes it special, um, we are encouraging those things to happen. So we are opening that up as much as possible. And then as we begin our planning for next year, um, and even for the summer, as we begin to look at summer school, and we begin to look at summer camps and summer activities, we are planning uh, for the summer and then into next year that we will be fully open uh, without restriction in Conroe ISD so that um, you know, travel plans, be it for cheerleader camp or drill team camp or band, summer band or athletics, whatever it may be, um, our current planning process is that those will be wide open and students will be able to get back to normal activity um, in, the, in those, in what, what it is that they do. And then we will be ready to open once again, wide open next school year. So that, that's a lot, right? Like, and we will continue to evaluate this, right? We need to watch what happens coming out of spring break to make sure that we don't have some crazy jump of numbers. Um, but as we work our way through the remainder of the year, we will constantly be looking at those numbers and doing more and more of what we consider to be normal activities moving forward. And um, that's exciting. Uh, I know that we, we really all long for that. Uh, and it's, it's exciting to see that, that we're here. It's, feel, it's felt like it's been so long. And it has been, it's been a whole year but here we are, we can see the end. It's out there, it's in front of us and it's not that far away and we can do this, right? We can make it, we can get to that finish line and do it successfully, do it safely. Uh, and we appreciate the fact that, that even if you don't 100% agree with it, that you will be with us and, and we can make this be successful. So um, let me see if we have any other notes here. Um, I think we've covered uh, most everything. I hope this has answered your questions. Uh, if it hasn't, we'll try to, we can try to catch up with you. But I hope that if you go back and you listen to these details, you can understand that we've tried to be um, as thorough as we can be with our decision-making process. We've tried to listen to those people that know more than we do. We've tried to, to lean on um, what we know works, what we've seen work. Um, we've tried to be smart with our decision-making processes and our number one goal, as it's been for forever, is to keep our schools 
open. We're confident that we can do it. It's going to be a wonderful last nine weeks. But before we get to that last nine weeks, we have a very important thing that we get to do, and that's spring break. So I wish you all uh, a wonderful spring break. I hope the weather cooperates with us and we, and we get that opportunity to get outside, uh, enjoy that break, come back geared up and ready for the last nine weeks. We want to finish the school year strong. We look forward to all the special events that, that are going to happen from proms to graduations to those end of the year activities at all of our schools. So much to look forward to as we return from spring break and we can't wait. So we wish you all a wonderful spring break, a wonderful night, and we'll look forward to talking to you um, into the future as we begin once again to talk about how great this last nine weeks will be and how much we're looking forward to next school year. Thanks for joining us once again. Wish you all a wonderful night.